Hello again everyone, I'm Dr. Ben. I'm a practicing emergency physician here in the Midwest of the United States. Thanks for watching my video. This is one part in a several part series on the COVID-19 virus and what we know so far. In this video, I'm going over specifically signs and symptoms of COVID-19. As always, the knowledge that I discussed in this video is subject to change as COVID-19 is a rapidly evolving situation. So first up, what are the symptoms of COVID-19? What should make me suspicious that I might have COVID-19? Unfortunately, this is what makes COVID-19 so tricky. There's not a single slam dunk sign or symptom that we can see on your exam or that you can tell us that makes me think, hmm, 100% you have COVID-19. There are certain things in a bundle of symptoms together that um, increase the suspicion, or at least for me as a practitioner, that you might have COVID-19. Particularly one that's become uh, more publicized that is quite specific for COVID-19 is the complete loss of taste and smell, but not everyone has that and other viruses can do that too. Also, a lot of the signs and symptoms I'm going to discuss are very common in many other diseases processes, including many other viruses. For example, the CDC has released a study in which 370,000 patients um, were examined to determine what the most common signs and symptoms that they had for COVID-19. Unsurprisingly, cough was number one in 50% of people having a cough. Fever was second most common with 43% of people either having a fever greater than 100.4 or feeling like they had a fever. Number three is myalgia, which is a fancy way of saying that your muscles hurt, your body hurts. You know, if you've ever been sick, you just feel crummy, like everything just kind of aches to move around. That's myalgia. That's 36% of people have that. Next up is headache with 34%, followed by shortness of breath. The medical term for that would be dyspnea, and that rounds out at 29%. Sore throat is next with 20%, followed by diarrhea with 19%, nausea, vomiting in 12%, loss of taste of smell, abdominal pain, and runny nose in less than 10% each. Now I have to say anecdotally, that seems a little bit off for me. I would say that more commonly, I see patients with loss of taste of smell than less than 10%. Additionally, Anecdotally, it seems like I see more patients who have gastrointestinal symptoms like the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea than what that study would suggest. But the coronavirus has been kind of evolving or, or, or changing over time as viruses do. So it's possible that this initial study out of China does have some skewed data. But I think it's an overall good, um, good study to look at in terms of the breadth of the symptoms and what the most common tend to be. Cough, fever, sore muscles, I think are, are definitely the top three. And because I was so interested in terms of, I thought that this study had a very low percentage for loss of taste and smell, I looked up a few more studies that have come out and I'm seeing that anywhere from 50 to 40% in some of these other studies say that people have lost taste and smell. So I think it's a more common thing that this initial Chinese study lets out. Another symptom that has been more frequently re reported is eye irritation. Uh, conjunctivitis is the medical term for that. Irritation around the eye itself or the tissue surrounding the eye. Um, it, it's kind of funny, my, my wife who's a nurse has kind of coined this term COVID eye where she sees this time and time again and something I'm starting to pick up too where pe patients with COVID tend to have this, this specific irritation around their eye. Again, if you have that, it could be from a lot of different things. It doesn't mean you have COVID, but just it's something that we're starting to see too. And again, to reiterate, unfortunately, there's not one sign or symptom where I could say, you definitely have COVID. So next up, how does COVID-19 progress? Or in other words, what's the clinical course of COVID-19? It, it tends to start like any other, other virus with more mild symptoms and then gradually ramping up. The incubation period, um, which I discussed in a previous uh, video, which I'll link below, uh, for COVID-19 is anywhere from two to 14 days. So two to 14 days after you're exposed to the virus from someone else is when you'll start showing symptoms. And then over the course of days, those symptoms which I just discussed will ramp up in intensity. Now, some people, they never get the shortness of breath, the lower respiratory symptoms. Symptoms do tend to progress over the course of the week with people following that one week point starting to make recovery. Although it can last longer, 
and it can be shorter. It's very variable. The most worrying symptom for me out of COVID-19 is dyspnea, which is, again, a fancy way of saying shortness of breath. Um, it's an indication that you might have low oxygen levels. And that, that shortness of breath is, is an indication that's starting to affect the lung tissue. And that's why COVID-19 is so deadly and why it overwhelms health systems so much is it will irritate lung tissue to the point where you can't breathe well enough to get your oxygen level high. And because of that, you need to be on supplemental oxygen, meaning you need to be hospitalized typically. That dyspnea, that shortness of breath, tends to occur anywhere from five to eight days after symptoms onset. Next up, how long does it take for you to feel better after you have recovered or are recovering from COVID-19? This again is a variable um, because everyone gets this disease in a little bit of a different way and everyone is a different age and has different medical comorbidities and in various degrees of health. The World Health Organization has put out that they, um, based on their data, seem to show that anywhere from two to four weeks is the typical recovery period for someone who has a more mild infection, with that increasing to three to six weeks for a more severe infection. There's also some studies that are coming out that seem to indicate that patients with mild infection have prolonged symptoms after they recover. Obviously, this is a little bit paradoxical, and I, I don't know that I have read a good explanation for why this occurs. Cough, fatigue, and chills tend to be the symptoms that um, prolong for longer periods of time. Prolonged recovery tends to be associated also with people who are of older age and people who are chronically more ill. So people who have more medical comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, lung disease, things like that. One of the more worrying things we're starting to learn about COVID-19 is that it, along with other coronaviruses, can have long-term impairment of pulmonary or lung function even after you recover. Also, we're seeing that patients who recover from COVID tend to have an increased rate of having heart complications, meaning that this virus, even if you get it and recover fully from it, could impact your lungs and your heart function on a long-term basis. Obviously, this pandemic is less than a year at this point, so we don't have data showing how long that this is going to occur, at what um, prevalence that this is occurring at, and what this means um, on a global health level. And also, I think to round this out, it's important to mention something called post-intensive care unit syndrome, where patients who are critically ill requiring intensive care unit um, care, even after they recover, are oftentimes um, quite debilitated, both physically and mentally, from what they went through in order to, to stay alive in the intensive care unit, meaning being on a ventilator, having their body almost shut down, and um, vital functions being performed by machines and medications. That, that is something that more and more in medicine is being studied in other diseases too, that is showing a, a long-term road to recovery even after you re recover from this initial illness. And COVID-19, like many other disease processes, is showing that too. All this to say that if you do get COVID-19 and recover from it, there is a chance that you're going to have a long-term impairment from it. The chances of this are, are low, just like any uh, mortality associated with COVID, when you know, we're talking in any 1% to 4% range, but still, that's a lot of people, and I don't think people fully realize just how many people that that has the potential to um, impact. So next up, let's say I'm starting to show these symptoms. Should I get tested for the COVID-19 virus? So the official answer is decisions about testing should go down to the local health department, your physician, um, and availability of testing in your area. However, I will say that if tests are available in your area and you're starting to show the symptoms that I discussed, I think the right thing to do is to get tested and home quarantine until you know the results of that test. Or if symptoms are continuing to, to increase and you're showing multiple symptoms of COVID-19, to continue to home quarantine even with a negative test because testing isn't 100%. There's still a chance that you test negative and you still have the disease. That happened to my wife um, herself um, who initially tested negative and then had a second test which was positive. So that first test was a false negative. If you are planning on being in public and you feel unwell and you're having the symptoms that I discussed previously, you should 
be home quarantining, you should not be out in public, and you should be getting a test. This next question I think is fantastic and something uh, that we should all know a little bit more about COVID-19, and that is, if I get COVID-19, what are the chances that I become critically ill? Now, the best data I could find on this was from the Chinese uh, Center for Disease Control, and in that, they uh, looked at around 400,000 uh, people who ended up getting COVID-19. Of those, 81% had mild disease, meaning it felt like a, a common cold or maybe a little bit worse than a common cold. 14% had more serious disease where it impacted the lungs and uh, impacted their ability to breathe. 5% had critical disease, meaning they went into respiratory failure, shock, multi-system organ dysfunction, meaning their body started to shut down. These are the patients who are, are truly critically ill requiring the ICU. And in that study, the case fatality, meaning uh, the chance you would die from COVID-19 was 2.3% for all comers. Now of those, there is a chance that even if you're a normal, healthy human being, you have minimal or no medical comorbidities, there's a chance you're gonna get critically ill. And that's unfortunately a part of the COVID-19 virus and something we don't well understand is some people, even though they're totally healthy, get extremely ill and can even pass away. But we do know that if you are an individual who has chronic medical conditions, you greatly increase your chance for becoming one of those critically ill COVID-19 patients, particularly patients who have underlying heart and lung disease or liver and kidney disease. Included in that are patients who have diabetes and patients who smoke. And obviously, if you're an older patient, there's a much greater chance that you would become critically ill as well. I'm gonna to briefly touch on one last thing, which is when is COVID-19 symptoms an emergency? And I'd like to do a whole video about this, um, but briefly I'll touch on it. Signs that make me think that you need help right away, whether it mean calling 911 or talking with your doctor in an immediate fashion would be a pressure or heaviness on your chest, difficulty breathing where you feel like you just can't catch your breath, an appearance of blueness around your um, your lips or your tongue, if you have trouble staying alert, or if you become confused. Any of the things I just mentioned, I would recommend you immediately contact the emergency medical services. I would say that if you're worried in any way that something doesn't feel right or there's something that makes you scared for your life or well-being, I think the safest thing would be to contact emergency medical services and get help. All right, everyone. Well, that concludes my episode about signs and symptoms of COVID-19. I hope you found that informative and can, can help you better understand the virus in some sense and, and have more of an intelligent discussion and, and monitor yourself more closely. One thing also I would like to do as a take home point is if you contract COVID-19, I highly recommend you get a pulse oximeter, which is something that fits on your finger and is able to sense your oxygen level. And if that is continually showing less than 90% that you should go to the hospital immediately. So I'll leave you here. I have more episodes coming up. I'm sorry for the delay in getting these episodes out. I'm kind of a, in a busy point in my life. I wish you guys all the best and stay happy, healthy, informed, and empowered.